If you have ever been treated for a chronic or an acute medical condition like cancer, diabetes, or high blood pressure, please raise your hand. Now imagine if I were to ask you, and don't worry, I'm not going to, but imagine if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you struggle with a mental illness, say depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or a panic disorder. See, sometimes when I ask that question in small group settings, believe it or not, I hear a lot of laughing and joking around and people saying to their neighbor, hey, you're a little crazy, you should be raising your hand. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that for those who know in their head and in their heart that they could be raising their hand because they truly do struggle with a mental illness, they might just rather cry a little bit inside. You see, the way we see mental illness in this country is different from the way we see any other kind of medical condition. And I find that surprising since about one in four of us will struggle with a mental illness at some point in our lives. This is a statistic that shows up consistently in all psychological research. It's one of the few stats that isn't up for debate. And what's worse is that according to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, one in 17 of us will suffer from a serious mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or chronic depression. NAMI also found that as many as 400,000 of the inmates held in our nation's prisons and jails suffer from a mental illness. Now I often wonder how many of those incarcerated could have walked another path, one of treatment, positive progress, and freedom, rather than one of sickness, punitive physical confinement, and lockdown. I mean, imagine if we were able to talk more openly about mental illness the way we do about other common health conditions. Imagine if we were advertising more heavily everywhere on where people could go to get treatment like we do for the various cancers. But the way our society currently views those with mental illness is creating justifications and rationalizations that are fostering a social stigma. We're refusing to talk real and raw about this and unfortunately that's setting up those with mental disorders to live and operate without accessing the proper help and treatments that they need. And in some cases, their illness escalates to the point of breaking the law, so we throw them in prison, out of sight, out of mind. What about suicide? This is another raw and unnecessary consequence of those quietly struggling with mental illness. Now, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there were 41,149 suicides in the U.S. in 2013. That's more than car accidents. It's more than homicides. Now, you know people don't kill themselves because they're happy. They also don't end their lives because they feel a little sad. It's usually because they're sick with an illness. They're in the depths of a major depressive episode or they're experiencing some other kind of a disturbing mental distress. And I believe that if we begin speaking about mental illness more like we speak about med other medical conditions, we might be able to help more people recognize that what they're grappling with is treatable and in doing so help them see that they can get better and understand where they need to go in order to start on their own path of mental wellness. As I hope you can see, this is a pretty important topic of discussion for me because I've gone from struggling with mental illness in my teens to finding ways to live with it and treat it in my 40s. Now life through my late teens and 20s was a bit of a mess. I was on and off of different medications, in and out of countless hospitals, treatment centers, places to live, and jobs. My first involuntary hospitalization occurred when I was 18 years old. Now when I was 27 years old, I had this fantastic idea to move from the East Coast away from what little support systems I had out to the Midwest. Now, any time I have ever done anything in my life that I could say was notable, it always started with a fantastic idea. <laughs> but this one was the beginning of a major downward spiral for me. I had no family support, I was unable to find any meaningful work, and I was really just one more pawn shop visit away from being homeless. Now within a year of complete disconnection from a world I thought I once knew, I found myself institutionalized again. This time, it looked to be indefinite. Now, due to the severity of my mental illness, my inability to hold down a job, and the mounting medical costs, someone suggested that I apply for SSDI. SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance. 
Now, in order to receive SSDI, there is this long application process to go through. And at the time, I was told I needed to have at least two medical professionals attest to my mental health condition, attest to the fact that I met the disability guidelines. Now, one of the guidelines was that my mental health condition made me unable to work and earn enough money. At the time, in 1997, the state of Indiana determined that enough money was just $500 a month. My mental health condition was preventing me from being able to work and earn just $500 a month. And my psychiatrist was fully on board with all this. In fact, he was ready and willing to fill out all the, all the, all the paperwork. I'm pretty sure he just started, too. The next most significant medical professional in my life was Jenny, the psych nurse. Now, Jenny made a profound impact on me while I was in that hospital. She was really the only person I could stand to be around and would even try to talk to at first. And Jenny talked to me a lot and educated me. She explained that SSDI would label me as disabled. She described how difficult it would be for me to get out of the system once I am in it and labeled disabled. She, she, she talked to me in depth about what was going on with me, about uh, my medications, how long I was going to need to take them, about my diagnosis and the SSDI application process. And I will never forget the moment when she sat in a chair directly across from me and she made a sincere connection and she said, I am not going to support this application process because I believe you can get better. Now, I could not fully comprehend the meaning of this at the time. I did get a little better, at least well enough to get up out of that hospital, but I didn't go straight back out into the world. Jenny helped me get placed into a halfway house. Now, living in a halfway house was far better than indefinite confinement in a state psychiatric institution, but with the focus mainly on addictions, a lot of other things that I struggled with remained untreated. I was unable to handle my placement there with my new housemates, so I left much earlier than I was supposed to, and eventually my illness escalated, I broke the law, and I ended up in jail. This was a major turning point for me. I started to recall all the things that Jenny said, and I started to comprehend what she was trying to tell me this time. And I realized that if I wanted to remain physically free and do anything worthwhile in this world, it, like, like earn at least $500 a month, I had to find a way to get better. Luckily, I was offered a pretrial diversion program that was gonna give me another chance, even though I technically didn't even meet the requirements for it. But with that program, I began to see that if I, if I did certain things and if I followed certain steps and if I showed up to all of my appointments and I took my medications as prescribed as though my life depended on it, and if I, if, if I tried with everything I had to do the right thing each day, I could get better. I just might be okay. I might be able to do something that matters in this lifetime. Now my story might resonate strongly with you. You may have a mental illness yourself. Whether you do or you don't, I know that your spouse or your family member, your friend or your coworker, or the person sitting next to you right now could be struggling. Remember one in four. Now we know that mental illness is treated unlike any other medical condition. So rather than continue to ignore it or avoid it through secrecy and silence, we can begin sharing in the responsibility to talk about what's really going on and begin recognizing the opportunity that's in front of us. We can penetrate the stigma surrounding mental illness and partner with those experiencing it. We can become an ally to those with mental illness to help them and their families live with their condition. I'm still very much living with mental illness. Now, while I was pretty stable in my 30s, shortly before the new year of 2014, now in my 40s, I began to get really sick again. You see, I had another one of those fantastic ideas, and I uh, quit taking my medications sometime before that. And through life's chain of events, eventually I went from keeping my head just above water to drowning and sinking into a really deep depression. I started feeling all the really bad things I felt before and became obsessed with thoughts that were just self-destructive, aggressive, and suicidal. And it was even more disturbing than ever before this time because I had so much more to lose. I mean, now I have a wife and a home. I had built up a business and a fairly decent reputation in the community through the positive connections I managed to create as a Rotarian. I mean, look at all I have, I said to myself. I should be happy. But my inside experiences were in no way matching up with my outside realities. You see, no matter how much I learn about my mental illness or how much positive progress I make, 
and never lose my capacity to experience real anguish with it. No matter how much love the supportive people in your life bring you, it can never replace the profound hatred you feel for yourself when depressed. No matter how logically somebody with mental illness manages to think about their condition, they just can't snap out of it. Fortunately, I have the most amazing wife, and she helped me find a way out. On March 17, 2014, I finally, finally found the courage and the words to explain to my wife that I was having troubles again. Now, she recognized right away that I needed some professional help. And she shared in a responsibility to keep me on the right path of treatment. I mean, she went so far as to call up the therapist after hours without my consent, pretending to be me. <laughs> so when he calls to schedule the appointment, the reality of what she just did hit me. But all I could say to that therapist was, and that was not me that called you. <laughs> that was my wife. I hate therapy. I'm only doing this for her. And believe me, I only agreed to go back into treatment because I knew if I followed through with any of the options I had in mind, it would only hurt my wife, my biggest support, my only reason to even try. You know, taking responsibility for your illness like this and doing what you need to do to get the right kind of help and support is never easy. Supporting someone you love with a mental illness is equally as difficult from what I've seen. I mean, looking back, I have mad respect for the people that are still around, that stuck around, that somehow figured out what to do, who picked me up every time I felt, or who checked in on me with a smile every so often and never gave up on me. Or they just tapped into some patience and stood strong like the guardrail I needed to stay on the path of, of wellness. I like to listen to a lot of heavy metal music. <laughs> and just this past February, while driving to my weekly rotary meeting in my lifted black pickup truck with huge wheels, I was listening to this band Slipknot. And I hear, <laughs> we bury what we fear the most. Approaching original violence is the silence where you hide it. Now this particular rotary meeting was difficult for me. I mean, believe it or not, I'm often extremely uncomfortable around people. And during those times it shows, and other members can usually tell when something isn't right with me. Well this time, a fellow Rotarian, we'll call him Anthony. Anthony says, hey Chris, what's going on? You okay? You seem a little off today. What's up? Man, I'm fine, I'm okay. And I shut him out and I walk away. You know, and most of the time, this is how it goes. Those that try to reach out to someone who's struggling with symptoms of a mental illness just end up getting shut out. And I started to recognize and somehow managed to get really honest with myself. I said, hey, Chris, come on. You're trying to talk to people about the stigma surrounding mental illness. And here's someone who's trying to open up some dialogue, make a sincere connection, and show support. And you just shut him out. So later, I sent him a text. And it went a little like this. Hey, thanks for checking in on me. I appreciate you connecting with me. I go through stuff. Uh, I really do appreciate you connecting with me. That's all you can do. Uh, I'll be all right, no worries. Just got to ride stuff out sometimes. His response? Some days are good, others better. And then there are those days. Keep your chin high and work through it. You know, the cool thing is, is he didn't say, snap out of it. He said, work through it. Now, for someone struggling with symptoms of a mental illness, we often bury what, what, what we fear the most. What, 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 it, it, we fear getting rejected by others because of our illness or because of the behaviors that might come out. Because let's face it, how we interact with others sometimes in our active illness, it can be a little difficult for others, some other people to tolerate, even the Anthony's in this world. So we deal with our fear through silence, and as a result, our connections with others break, and we don't access the proper help and support systems we need to get better. Now I'm betting that if you're not trying to deal with your own mental illness, you might be like an Anthony. You might want to be a part of the solution. If that's you, I really want you to know that when you reach out, you may not get the response you were hoping for, but know that when you reach out, it does matter. I ask mental health professionals like Jenny to understand that when you intervene and do what your gut tells you is the right thing to do, you may not be around later to see the real fruits of your labor, but your patience, guidance, and kindness matters. Your words are heard and eventually understood. I ask family members like my wife to understand that 
Bending the rules a little and practically forcing someone you love back into treatment may not feel great because of the resistance you receive, but it's worth it. You are the strongest guardrail on someone's path to mental wellness. Where do you fall? Are you a mental health professional? Are you a loved one closest to someone with a mental illness? Or are you a community member, a friend, or an acquaintance to someone struggling? Wherever you fall, when you talk about mental illness more openly and when you step into your support role and share in the responsibility to talk about what's really going on, you become a guardrail on someone's path to mental wellness. And as more of us break the silence, we will break down the stigma and change the existing attitudes and beliefs that keep those suffering from getting better. And those of us with mental illness may have an easier time being honest with what we're going through and stop burying what we fear and stop hiding in silence. Now, for those of you who are Living with a mental illness like me, I am not letting you off the hook here. If you have a diagnosis, I challenge you to learn what it means and what behaviors you exhibit that qualifies you for that. And then accept it, not as an excuse to make bad choices, but as a reason to seek help. Even if all your attempts to get help in the past have been met with frustration, keep poking the mental health system until you find what's right for you. Because in a world where you can feel so alone, sometimes you have to be your own advocate, give yourself another chance, and ask for help. When everything feels uncomfortable and scary, you have to look for supportive people you can trust. And if those supportive people in your life feel that you may benefit from medication or therapy, listen to them. And finally, always remember, some days are good, others better. And then there are those days, keep your chin high and work through it because eventually you'll be okay and sometimes okay can feel pretty good. <laughs>